a pipeline across the Negev Desert, Israel is building an oil lifeline that will span the country from the Gulf of Aqaba to the Mediterranean Sea. When completed, the pipeline will help Israel bypass the Suez Canal, closed to her by Egypt. At the southern end of the canal, two German crane ships write an explosive-laden Egyptian vessel in preparation for the reopening of the vital waterway. UN officials Bunch and Hammershield watch the final salvage operations. A seagoing tug sunk in November to sabotage the canal emerges encrusted with barnacles and marine growth. Six months on the bottom have created a difficult cleanup job for the salvage crew. The canal is at last open to all size ships, but in the troubled Middle East, where every day stirs new tensions, the cheers of the shore crowds are clouded by the continuing crisis. In the Sahara Desert, French engineers are drilling for oil, hoping for reserves large enough to free their country from dependence on the Middle East. Six wells are already producing oil, and preparations are going forward for 150 more drillings. The free world wishes success to France's search for oil beneath the sands of the Sahara. Paris is aglow to welcome England's Queen Elizabeth on her state visit to France. A boat ride on the Seine with President Coty lets the people of Paris relive the pomp and pageantry of 17th century France. The river is alive with displays and its bank becomes a stage for a series of historic tableaux. All along the four mile route there is dancing on the floodlit shore. Elizabeth is the first reigning queen to visit France since Victoria, and crowds on bridges and at windows reflect the warmth of the Paris reception. For England's queen, a never-to-be-forgotten ride on the River Seine. History's first man-made satellite is photographed for the first time as it is being readied for launching early next year. The sphere is treated with a special coating to protect its delicate instruments against the extreme temperatures of outer space. The reflective coating will also make the missile easier to observe, a satellite pioneer in the new frontier of the sky. A swarm of 100,000 starlings sweep out of the sky over Holland, a devastating armada whose shrill cries are deafening, recorded by the camera in sight and sound. slopes of Mont Blanc, loftiest peak in Europe, are the goal of a rescue party of skiers. A cameraman follows the men as they push across the Grand Plateau toward the summit. The skiers are hoping to recover the bodies of two marooned climbers who were frozen to death after earlier rescue attempts failed. A helicopter will airlift the victims off the mountainside after their discovery by the ski party. All but invisible in the vast sea of snow, copter and rescuers rendezvous high on Mont Blanc. Gales and blizzards prevented climbers from reaching the victims until, at last, the helicopter brings them down. Awesome as an A-bomb mushroom, a tornado howls into Dallas, Texas. Sides of buildings were sheared away by the tornado, which left 500 persons homeless along its erratic 15-mile course. Mountainous debris is stark testimony to the whirlwind fury of the Texas Twister. Victoria Falls, one of the most beautiful natural spectacles in the world, is swollen by spring floods, a plunging waterfall wider and more than twice as deep as mighty Niagara. Equatorial Africa's rainy season has swollen the Zambezi River 
that feeds the 343 foot falls. A hydroelectric plant built to harness the tremendous water power is engulfed by the torrent on the way to the precipice. The great African explorer David Livingston discovered the falls in 1855 and named them for Queen Victoria. But to the natives of the region, they are called as they have been for centuries, the smoke that thunders. Roundup time for cowboys of Indian ancestry on the Pagan Reserve in southwest Alberta. Riding the range, they're out to corral 4,000 head of prize Hereford stock. The cowboys are old hands at keeping the cattle on the move. In scenes reminiscent of the big drives on our own western plains 75 years ago. Once a wild horse reserve, the prairie still has a few stray bands of untamed horses. But the coming of the railroad, as it did in the United States, has changed the face of what was once a virgin wilderness. The Indian cowboys ride close herd on the cattle, covering an average of 50 miles during the two-day roundup. The reserve is one of the biggest cattle ranches in Canada, and it's a man-sized job to corral the giant herd, scattered over several hundred square miles. The cattle must be moved slowly, for running means loss of good beef weight. Safely in their pens, they will command top prices on the world market. The Indian cowboys of Alberta are keeping alive a way of life that helped America in the winning of the West. One of the seven wonders of the modern world, the Taj Mahal. A 17th century Indian emperor had 20,000 men labor for 22 years to raise its gleaming dome and towering spires. Muslim visitors must, according to their religion, remove their shoes before they enter. The building is the tomb of the Shah Jahan and the wife for whom he planned the Taj Mahal as an eternal shrine. The walls are of pure white marble. The decorations are of unsurpassed beauty. The tomb's intricately wrought mosaics are set with rare and precious stones. The Taj Mahal and its attached buildings occupy nearly 42 acres. Leading to the temple are rows of trees planted by the Shah Jahan himself. Reflecting a mood of mystic fascination and lyric beauty, a dream in marble designed by titans and finished by jewelers, the Taj Mahal. These are high-speed motion picture cameras, so fast that they can actually magnify time. Each one is capable of taking pictures at several thousand frames per second. When these films are slowed down and projected on a screen at normal speed, a second of action can be stretched or magnified to eight and a half minutes. Here, at regular speed, twin weights are fired from a test gun by Lockheed aircraft engineers. Filmed at 3,000 frames per second, then run normally, here is the same explosion. The super speed cameras have become valuable tools in guided missile research. Now a third look at the test firing, this time photographed at 8,000 frames per second. No human eye could have followed all that happens as the weights spin clear of the gun. But the high speed camera captures every second of action, stretches it like rubber, and freezes it for intensive study by Lockheed's research engineers. At a bomb-proof test range in Calaveras, California, Stanford scientists are working with a camera able to photograph at the incredible rate of four and one-half million frames per second. 
The inner workings of the camera are geared to microseconds. The image is caught on a metal mirror that can revolve 18,000 times per second. The mirror reflects the image through a series of lenses set around it. Passing through the lenses, the image is caught and etched on film frames that split action into millionths of a second. There are 25 frames of film on each strip. While the normal camera stops its film and opens its shutter to take each frame, this super speed camera keeps its film moving continuously. The camera is set now to photograph a jet charge piercing a plate of glass. The research scientist leaves the camera room and takes his place at the control panel. All observers have taken cover as the jet charge is fired. Watch it in regular motion. The camera records what to the eye was just a white puff. Here again is the jet stream completely through the glass before the pane has started to shatter. Next, a jet charge is fired through a steel plate. Many times faster than the speed of sound, the explosive stream streaks through the metal far ahead of the shock waves. In the high-speed camera, science has given man a new means of exploring the secrets of time. In its picturesque setting in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park, the de Young Memorial Museum is one of America's great art galleries, a museum that believes art is for all. In the junior workshop, youngsters from four to nine find the museum a place of enchantment. Here, under professional supervision, they are free to express themselves as they wish, to mirror their minds on the paper before them. Their interest awakened, the young painters are anxious to learn more about art through the ages. A great stained glass window represents one of the beginnings of modern art, telling a story in pictures in a period when most people were unable to read. Baked into the glass, the faces of the prophets remain perfectly preserved 600 years after their creation. Coming to a 15th century tapestry, the children learn that its closely woven threads kept the castle's cold walls from chilling the room where it hung. Silk threads woven into the wool design gave it great beauty, but the threads with time are wearing apart. The tapestry's one-dimensional flatness is typical of early art. The artists of Italy were to introduce the feeling of space and distance in paintings. The Annunciation still tells a story, but with greater realism, Perspective gives a feeling of depth and makes the painting appear much like a stage. By the 16th century, art had become a classic form of expression. This was the age of the great masters. The Italian artist Titian painted a friend of the artist with almost photographic detail. Using informal simplicity, he dedicated the portrait by means of a slip of paper in his friend's hand. This 17th century painting, Christ in the Garden with Mary Magdalene, is the work of two master artists. The figures are by Peter Paul Rubens, while the garden background with its intricate flowers is by Jan Bruegels, the elder, an unusual example of artistic collaboration. Among the museum's priceless paintings is Joris de Gallery by Rembrandt. Completed in 1632, the masterpiece is marked by the artist's fine, smooth brush strokes. A self-portrait by Rembrandt, painted 21 years later, reflects a dramatic change in the artist's style, an unevenness of stroke and a boldness of line. The 64 galleries contain treasures from all over the world. This hand is from a statue of Buddha, sculptured by some nameless Chinese artist 1,500 years ago. In an authentic 18th century room, two teenage artists sketch tapestries of a bygone age. The enjoyment of art knows no age limits. These are four to nine-year-olds. 
this is the 9 to 12 year old class. It's understanding and appreciation of art growing with the years. In the adult group, teenagers are joined by older men and women who have found a satisfying challenge in painting for pleasure. Members of the museum staff help all students develop their own skills. Whether they come to look or to sketch or to paint, visitors to the De Young Museum carry away an ageless lesson that art is indeed for all. A lonely fighting ship facing her biggest battle, the one that may finish her. This is the aircraft carrier Enterprise, moored with her memory. Almost forgotten in the swirling tide of history are her name and glorious record. In World War II, the Big E destroyed nearly a thousand planes and sank 74 Japanese ships. On the deserted flight deck, an old crewman walks and remembers. But he is alone, alone on a ship that was home to 32,000 fighting men during nine years of active duty. Gunner's mate Charles Kish was aboard when a Japanese suicide plane exploded and hurled its shell-pocked wing onto the flight deck. The enemy sent as many as 84 planes against the Big E in a single day, but they could not sink her. Admiral William F. Halsey is another who remembers, for the Enterprise was his flagship in the early days of the war. As he boards her again, his memories are of Pearl Harbor and how planes launched from the carrier were among the first to engage the enemy. That was the beginning, 15 years ago, when the Admiral led the Enterprise into battle. With Bull Halsey on the bridge, the ship became the heart of the Pacific Fleet, the only carrier to fight through four years of war. She took more punishment than any other Navy ship and her crew suffered with her. Time and again, Japanese kamikaze pilots tried to plunge their planes into the Big E. For ship and men, there was no place to hide. They were fighting to live against a suicide pilot fighting to die. No one knew who would win. the armor of a flaming phantom, the kamikaze pilot dove into the curtain of anti-aircraft fire as the crew watched and waited on the edge of eternity. Any hour of any day, the ship could come under attack. Six times the Japanese claimed their planes had destroyed her, but the elusive galloping ghost would always turn up to batter them once more. the first attack on Japanese territory at the Marshall and Gilbert Islands. She took part in every major Pacific action except the Battle of the Coral Sea. She won 20 battle stars. Heroism became almost commonplace. A wounded pilot lost control of his crippled plane and hunched unconscious in the cockpit as the craft caught fire. A fellow crewman led the rescuers. Men who had risked their lives against the enemy did not weigh the danger as they raced to help their shipmate. They only knew he could and must be saved. By war's end, the Enterprise had recorded more than 54,000 takeoffs from her flight deck. Admiral Halsey, like all Americans, could forget the infamy of Pearl Harbor and rejoice in the final surrender of Japan. The Big E's job was done. Steaming proudly into New York Harbor, she seemed an everlasting tribute to the Navy men and women who fought so gallantly to win victory in World War II. But today, remembered by only a few, the Enterprise is scheduled to be scrapped. Admiral Halsey is leading the fight to preserve her and asking all Americans to join him. Indifference, he says, is threatening to do what the enemy in a score of battles could never do. As 
as Admiral Halsey mounts the stairs to his old quarters, he thinks of the Battle of Midway, how the Big E's plane sank two and possibly all four of the Japanese carriers destroyed in the decisive battle of the Pacific War. Fateful decisions were made in the Admiral's cabin. Around this conference table, now stacked with upturned chairs, to the Admiral who is seeking to make her a permanent naval shrine and museum, the Enterprise is a living symbol of America's willingness to fight and die in the defense of freedom. Her sprawling hangar deck will never again echo to the roar of aircraft. Her guns are silenced forever. Her future is uncertain. But the heroic history and traditions of the Enterprise have made her a part of America's heritage.